Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to our webinar for IOSH Swiss Network. My name's Alison Hind. I'm the, the chair of the group. So for today, it gives my great pleasure to welcome Michelle Twig to come and talk to us about asbestos. Um, Michelle currently is a health safety systems and projects manager at Aggregate Industries, but she has a very long uh, career in uh, asbestos management uh, from an occupational hygiene perspective, um, including big projects like working on the Olympic Park, where she tells me that she once gave it a make it safe sticker to Ezzy Izzard. So a few claims to fame in there and, and um, some good stories, I'm sure. So um, welcome, Michelle, and um, thank you for joining us. Hi, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for um, inviting me to talk about asbestos. It's something I like to do a lot. Um, I like to talk about asbestos. Um, it's a great passion of mine. So um, today we're going to go through um, the systematic failures that lead to asbestos exposures. And these are some of the points that um, I've come across over the years um, doing audits, inspections um, and management projects where exposures have happened. And when you do root cause analysis, there's been some opportunities to have avoided that um, quite a way into the beginnings of a process. So when a decision has been made to either operate a process or purchase a new building or change something, there have been plenty of opportunities where asbestos could have been um, picked up, identified and exposures um, prevented. So that's what I'm going to look at today. Um, but what I am going to do is go through some key facts to start with. So we'll look at the scale of global ill health um, in relation to asbestos related diseases. We'll go through some of those health hazards and those health issues and about some of the mechanics around how they form. Um, and we'll talk about asbestos containing materials um, specifically. So I will touch on that we have some occupations around the world where we're still producing asbestos out of the ground, we're still making products, but primarily I'm going to focus on um, asbestos that's actually in present in buildings and structures. Um, we're going to go through some of the systematic failures that you know, we can look to um, early interventions to prevent these harmful exposures from happening. Um, a bit about around the occupations that are still at risk, a bit about how leadership and accountability can um, make a massive difference. We'll talk about competence, obtaining and sharing information and the awareness of the workforce. And and right at the end, I'll take you through some resources that you can use yourselves or go for for further information. So my experience then, um, this picture here is, uh, is of a nuclear power station. This is in Dungeness in Kent, in southeast England, and that's where I grew up. So if you look out the back gate of my mum's garden, that's the view we had. Um, and like most other people on Romney Marsh, um, I ended up working at that nuclear power station. Um, I worked on A Station, which are the two little um, buildings to the left there, and that was a um, one of the first generation of nuclear power stations. It was constructed in the 1950s, and there was a lot of asbestos in there. Part of my role as an industrial chemist, uh, in training I hasten to add, um, was the identification of suspicious materials. So we knew um, that asbestos was in the lagging, there was boards, it was, oh, it was just um, a, a minefield really. Um, but sometimes we would find um, suspicious looking deposits of dust or materials that we didn't know what it was. So our role as chemists was to do some analysis. We'd do some fibre counting, some fibre identification to see whether that actually had asbestos in and then we could take the appropriate management um, responses to that. So that's where I started learning around industrial use of asbestos. Um, and then I went into a consultancy route and um, started to become um, an asbestos surveyor. So I would then go out and look for asbestos in, in lots and lots of different places. Um, and then once I'd um, had enough of that, because it's quite hard, dirty uh, work, um, I started to look more around the management project side. So um, looking at whether removal projects were um, well managed, auditing projects that had asbestos in situ and whether that was being well managed and then some incident investigations as well where exposures had happened and we went in to do some root cause analysis as to how they got to that position. So that's my experience that started around in the mid 90s um, and so I've, I've uh, been around with asbestos for a while. Um, so asbestos is um, one of the main causes of occupational fatalities around the world. Um, we can see here that these um, figures have come from um, global collation of data. 
Um, lung cancer associated with asbestos is around 181,000 deaths a year globally. Um, mesothelioma, 27,500 um, asbestosis, and then we have some other cancers that are caused through um, occupational exposure to asbestos. So this is a massive global problem. Um, in the UK, to put that in con context underneath there, um, we have um, two and a half thousand deaths that we, are, we know are directly associated with exposure to asbestos with mesothelioma. We know we have around 500 deaths every year through asbestosis and over 5,000 deaths in total uh, relating to lung cancer as well. So for every fatality we have in the UK, so there's around about between 140 and 147 fatal accidents, the, we're losing a lot, lot more people through past exposures to um, asbestos. These exposures will have happened decades ago, but what concerns me is I still see and hear of exposures that are happening out there in the workplace where this has not been eliminated. We still have exposures that can lead to these deaths in the future. And these trends here that I've, I've picked out from the UK statistics do reflect other European countries as well. So we have a global health crisis in terms of asbestos management. We do um, expect those to peak at some point and we look at the global trends of when asbestos was banned. They will peak and they will plateau and then we should see a decline. But um, that peak hasn't happened as quickly as some people thought. If you go back 20 years, we thought that peak um, would have happened by now, but it hasn't. So it's still showing that, you know, we're still getting some significant exposures around the world. So going on then to inhalable and respirable fibres, because um, this is the problem that we're facing when asbestos is, um, if it's in a cont asbestos container material, such as a building product, like an insulation board or a cement roof, we break into those products and then inhalable and respirable fibres are released into the air. Once they're airborne, we breathe them in and that's when they can start to cause us some harm. So the picture on the left there you can see that looks like a, a needle jabbing into a big splodge is actually um, an asbestos fibre that's being attacked by a macrophage um, killer cell. So within our bodies we will have these cells that detect foreign bodies and they will go and try and attack them um, by chemically dissolving them. And one of the properties around asbestos is that it is very chemically resistant and so these macrophages do not break down these fibres. So the next stage in that is that the, the, the fighter cell, the macrophage, sends a connection out saying I ha this hasn't worked and so the body will then wrap collagen around that foreign body, around that fibre to stop it doing any more damage. So that essentially becomes scar tissue. So when we're looking at diseases like asbestosis, that is the scarring up of the lung where the fibres have been embedded and the body's way to stop them doing further damage is to wrap scar tissue around. But obviously the more fibres that we breathe in and are exposed to and get embedded in the lung, the more of the lung becomes scar tissue. That's dead tissue and so our respiration doesn't work anymore. So we get breathing problems and lung diseases. And alongside that, we might then start uh, developing tumours and that leads to the lung cancer. So on the right hand side, you can see um, uh, x-ray of lungs and if that was a perfectly healthy um, body you would see very two dark patches that are the shape of the lungs but what we can see there is lots of webbing and shadowing and some some shading as well which indicates they're not healthy lungs so within that lung um, there's been some fibrosis some asbestosis building up and possibly other things happening as well so that's how what that's what happens the um, fibers get into our lungs and the macrophages try and chemically dissolve them. They can't, they get wrapped in collagen and scar up the lungs. And they may also trigger other things that set off um, the development of uh, cancer, the tumours. So um, I'm hoping there's nobody red, green, colourblind here. Otherwise this won't be working very well. But this little um, animation shows you um, just the extent that these fibres reach. So inhalable fibres are fibres that are of a size that we can breathe in, but they don't actually reach that far into our lungs. Um, they're also a size of fibre that our bodies can deal with um, in our own natural defences. So our own natural defence against dust and fibres um, is the mucous membrane and um, nasal hairs and things like that that trap fibres and our body will sneeze, cough, spit them back out, 
um, if they hit the mucous membrane in the respiratory tract in the throat, then we might get them coated in mucus and they get swallowed and dealt with elsewhere. So if we overburden our natural defences, and that's usually through occupational exposures, then they can get deeper into the lungs. And respirable fibres are that small that they do bypass that natural first defence of the mucous membrane and the nasal hairs. So they get deeper and deeper into the lungs. And respirable fibres behave much more like a gas than they do, um, you'd expect a solid particle to, to respond. So once they are airborne, they stay in our breathing zone for a long time and you get um, air movement and movement keep them airborne for a lot longer so they don't settle. So actually when we're producing respirable fibres, we're actually creating a plume in which we would breathe in, but then those respirable fibres remain airborne for a lot longer. And so we're having more opportunity to be exposed. But with asbestos, if there are no fibres released, then there is no disease risk. So this is why we can actually leave asbestos in some properties, in some buildings. Um, if it's not going to be damaged and disturbed, then it's safer to leave it there and manage it than it might be to get it all removed. And um, if you look at some businesses might have a massive burden with asbestos, um, removal is expensive, it needs to be phased. So if we can manage asbestos in situ and not create those fibres, then you know, we can manage it. The fibres are released generally when people don't know that they are um, breaking into asbestos containing products. Um, and that's where we need to think about how we have systems in place to make sure everybody is aware of what that asbestos is and where it is. So the diseases that we can um, get then from being exposed to asbestos, um, asbestosis is the one there. And as I said, that is where we get the scarred up lung tissue where the fibres are embedded into the lungs um, and they wrap the scar tissue around and create scarred tissue. Asbestosis, um, where asbestos has been banned, um, is a disease that you would see declining. Asbestosis is more traditionally linked with people that um, produce asbestos products, create um, um, asbestos containing materials and install them. So you would have seen a, a heavier burden of asbestosis for people that were installing asbestos products in the 50s, 60s and 70s, as opposed to people now where we don't get that very heavy um, burden of fibres in the air. Um, mesothelioma is one type of cancer that um, is directly linked to um, asbestos. And that is a type of cancer that attacks the lung lining. So our lungs sit within um, a pleural sac, um, a very thin membrane, and the tumour happens to form between the lung and the lining, which makes it very hard to detect um, and it makes it virtually inoperable and hard to treat. So actually a prognosis for somebody diagnosed with mesothelioma um, has been over the years around a year to two years um, because it's that far advanced that once it starts to um, show signs that somebody reports they're feeling unwell, it's quite far advanced. Positively though, we have seen some success um, in recent years with some drug therapies that's, that kind of hold the progression a little bit but generally mesothelioma if you get that diagnosis it's a terminal one. Um, lung cancer again um, other types of lung cancer can be associated with asbestos um, exposure. Um, we also have benign pleural disease such as pleural plaques and this is where the fibres cause hardening around the lungs and around the lap, that pleural sac. So they might, might not be cancerous it's not a disease that may progress and create tumours if you get enough of them on the long lining, then it does restrict respiration and it can be unpleasant and it can affect people's ability to breathe properly. We get calcification, which is similar to the pleural plaques. And there's also links to ovarian cancer and laryngeal cancer as well. Um, we're probably going to be focusing more on the, risk, the lung based diseases because of the respirable um, risk created from working with asbestos containing materials that are already in situ. So moving on then to asbestos types, just so that everybody's got um, a, a, a bit of a refresher or a clear understanding of the types of asbestos that we have. So asbestos is actually um, split into two types. We have serpentine, um, which is chrysotile or white asbestos, and that is a curly fibre that is made in layers and layers of crystals that create these curly um, pictures that you can see on the screen there. And then we have amphiboles, which are the... Um, very thin needle-like um, fibres that once you start producing them, they just get thinner and thinner and thinner. 
um, and so they're, they're not visible with the naked eye. But we traditionally deal with brown asbestos and blue asbestos, and they're uh, sort of formal names, amazite and chrysidolite. They're the two main amphibol asbestos types that were used um, in asbestos products. We do have some other ones, the um, anthophyllite, tremolite and actinolite, but they tend to be more of a contaminant to materials um, such as vermiculite and talc and other mineral-based products, as opposed to something that was mined with a purpose to create asbestos-containing materials. So asbestos uses then. So asbestos has had some quite um, interesting um, uses over the years. Some we can see here, they're actually used for um, cigarette filters. Um, we've actually got some that was used as fake snow. So if anybody's seen the Christmas film, White Christmas, where the snow is on the, on the ground, that was actually white asbestos that they were using. Um, it's been used for roofing, it's been used for clothing, and even Marvel created a villain called Asbestos Lady, um, who used to set fires and use her asbestos clothing to go and rob people. So it's had quite um, a varied and vivid um, presence in our uh, culture and our workplace. Um, but focusing on the more uh, problematic ones that we have now are the asbestos containing materials that we have in buildings and structures um, all around the world. So from public buildings such as hospitals, schools, um, civic centres, community centres, um, office blocks, housing blocks, wherever there would be a large collection of people, asbestos would likely have been used because of its fire protection properties mainly. So it does have fantastic fire protection properties. However, we know that once that gets broken down and the fibers become airborne, that we actually breathe them in and they create um, some very severe health hazards to people. So some of the explanation around these pictures then, in the top corner there you can see a steel beam and that has been protected with sprayed asbestos. And sprayed asbestos is probably, you know, it's the most vulnerable type of asbestos in terms of fiber release because it would have a protective coating. It's quite friable, it's quite vulnerable to damage. And um, that would have been sprayed on structures, on ceilings and roofs um, to give that level of fire protection. Um, what we can see there is that's been poorly removed. So we've got some that's been left behind. And um, we go further along the beam, we can see some residue um, that's been left behind and underneath there, there's some lagging. Moving along to the right, we've got some asbestos insulation board. That's in not so great condition. Um, that would, you wouldn't want that left there. And it's quite vulnerable as well because it's at ground level. So anybody can knock things into that um, and that would be pretty um, vulnerable to damage. And once it's damaged again, it releases fibers. Um, and again, on that top one, we see some asbestos ceiling boards, but actually they're in really good condition. They've been coated and protected. Um, and they're not that vulnerable to damage. So actually, that's the type of material that you would say on the balance of things, I would leave that in place and manage it as opposed to get it, it would be immediately removed. Um, at the bottom there, we've got some uh, asbestos lagging around pipes. This was actually on a ship and um, you can see that's really badly damaged. So every time somebody goes down those set of steps, they would be wafting past, disturbing that asbestos and the fibres would become airborne. And so you don't necessarily have to directly work with asbestos to be exposed. That would be causing exposure to anybody that's walking through um, that area. Um, we've got uh, some acoustic board on the right hand side. And that um, is, um, you can tell it's acoustic board by the holes drilled in. Um, and you can see there's a little bit of damage there. And on the building, we can see that the soffit, which is the board underneath the edge of the roof, um, is asbestos as well. So fascias and soffits on buildings, um, again, prime locations for asbestos. Um, on this slide, we can see we've got asbestos cement products, we've got roof uh, material, we've got a drain pipe and guttering. Again, that's quite commonplace. And with asbestos cement, if it's quite well bonded. So it's not necessarily that vulnerable um, that it would be sat there releasing fibres because they're bonded within the cement. Um, however, if you start to break that down and it becomes degraded, then you start to get fibre release on that. Um, some more obscure uses, there's a toilet system there. Um, so old fashioned Bakelite products like telephones, toilet seats, toilet systems would have had asbestos in. We've got bonded floor tiles again, fibre release from those tiles is, is low. So on the balance of things, I'd rather be dealing with bonded floor tiles than it would be 
asbestos insulation board. We've got a fire blanket. Again, materials were used um, in the 50s. We would have seen a lot of upholstery as well. So furniture, curtains, um, fireproof clothing for the armed services would have been made. And the next slide along, there would be rope gaskets in that um, boiler. So again, rope, asbestos rope used in fire doors and gaskets. Um, and then we've got some other products. We've got paper electrical insulation products that we can find, composite materials such as gaskets and brake linings. It would have been used in those. And then we've got de decorative texture coatings. Um, again, very popular through the 70s and 80s for households to um, use this kind of decorative coating. Um, and that, again, would have asbestos in it. So in terms of what's left in situ in buildings and structures around the world and globally, um, particularly in Europe, these are the types of materials that we need to be uh, concerned with. So this image is taken from um, guidance within the health and safety executive um, materials that they make publicly available. They have a version of this for domestic properties as well, but it's a good indication um, if you were to go around top to floor, starting underground and working your way to the roof, just how many locations within a building we can find asbestos. Um, so this, again, I'll, I recommend going into this resource on the health and safety website because it um, is really good for sharing information, particularly if you've got um, contractors that are coming to do some maintenance or decorating work. Um, some of the smaller scale sole traders, self-employed people um, don't have the awareness that we would like them to have. Um, it's something I've come across with uh, training around those, those kind of people before. So who is at risk then? So it's estimated World Health Organization says there's around about 125 million people occupationally exposed worldwide. So that's a massive amount of people that we need to be thinking about protecting. Um, anyone who breathes in respirable dust and fibers is at risk, but there is a dose response relationship with asbestos. So some people um, uh, will have heard the term one fiber can kill. And that's not strictly true. So basically that came from um, an analysis, um, a, a debate within Parliament in the UK that we would have um, a dose. Basically, evidence was being presented to show that we needed to take some action around controlling asbestos. And um, they drew a graph with some spots all over it to show the level of um, rate of disease and drew a best th fit line through it. And what somebody suggested was if you put that best fit line um, down to zero, then zero fibres, no disease, but actually one fibre, you could get a disease. And actually that's a misinterpretation. It is a dose response relationship. So it means that we can be exposed to asbestos to a certain level and it would probably do us no harm. And in fact, we are environmentally exposed to asbestos, especially if you live in a city or you um, use public transport, so underground surfaces, um, such as tubes, metros, whatever, because of the use of asbestos within that infrastructure in the past. But we're not occupationally exposed to that. And so at a certain point, we can have a level of resistance. Our bodies can cope with that. Once we start to get an occupational type exposure and our dose and our exposure increases, that tips a balance within our body's ability to cope and that triggers the ill health. So while we want to take it very, very seriously and we want to focus on those occupational exposures, um, it is related to how much we are exposing people to. Um, it substantially increases the risk with um, coexistence with tobacco smoke. So if we have a population of people that are occupationally exposed and they smoke tobacco, they are instantly increasing their risk of an occupational disease um, such as lung cancer or mesothelioma. Um, and the more you smoke, the more you increase the risk of those diseases developing. Um, I don't understand all the mechanics around that, but one of the issues is that smoking, the tobacco smoke actually does paralyze one of our body's first defenses against um, breathing in fibers and dust. So if, if we think about, um, uh, that image that I showed earlier with the coloured dots flowing in and out of the lungs. In our respirable tract, we have cilia, which are the um, sort of 
bits in our body that move around and wave around and if you used to see them under a microscope moving they look like fields of wheat in the wind so what they do is they keep moving and they keep anything that we're breathing in at the top of our respiratory tract to help it get back into the mucous membrane so we can swallow it or spit it or sneeze and cough it out what smoking does is it actually paralyzes those cilia for a short time and so while we're smoking um, those cilia are less effective and that then means that we've got more dust going deeper into the lung so if our body is a smoker or has lived with a smoker and you get that kickstart coughing in the morning and once they have their first cigarette it settles it's that kind of um, mechanism overnight when you're not smoking the cilia start to work again and they're starting to produce things that um, from the lung to get out of it and that's what the first morning smokers cough is all about so who is at risk then? People that are um, obviously mining and manufacturing, and there are some countries that we still have um, producing um, asbestos-containing materials. We have people that are installing those ACMs. So where there is no ban, if people are buying asbestos-containing products and they're installing them, then they're at risk. And there are issues around uh, quarrying around the world where mineral is present as a natural contaminant. Um, but again, that's that's something we're not going to focus on too much. What I'm going to focus on are the removal operatives, the construction and allied trades, and the users of public buildings because they're um, something a, a more commonplace and are normally under a bit more of our control. So the common mistakes that lead to asbestos exposures is generally where there is poor quality information around um, available so um, people do not know that the, the materials they're dealing with contain asbestos or they're not really clear on the condition of them um, and it's also about the quality of information being gathered and the way it's communicated so if we um, are in control of a building and it contains asbestos we should have um, a record of where that asbestos is and what condition it's in and we need to make sure that we communicate that information to anybody that might come across and, and work with that material, but also near the material. Because we do see um, exposures that happen where people are not directly working on the asbestos, but because they are working nearby and they inadvertently damage it, um, become exposed. So it's around knowing where that information is around where it is, what condition it is, and how vulnerable it is to damage. Um, it's the competence of people managing the risk. So I have done investigations around asbestos exposures. And if I ask the question, um, who's responsible for managing asbestos? Whose problem is it? They'll generally say it's health and safety. And it's the site manager, the person who's locally responsible. We'll go and look at that person who's got the local responsibility of where that asbestos is located. And they won't have had adequate training on how to manage risk. They might be aware that asbestos is there. Sometimes they're not even aware that asbestos is there. So when we are putting people in positions of responsibility, we need to make sure that they are competent to deal with that element of risk that they are managing. And probably one of the most important things is the awareness and competence of people who directly work with asbestos, whether they knowingly working with it or they don't. And I... I have trained um, a lot of people over the years in asbestos awareness, particularly in the construction industry, and I've been doing it up until a couple of years ago, and I'm still shocked at how many people don't know the dangers associated with asbestos. Because this has been such a big part of my life, I think, you know, we've been training people out, HSE have been enforcing it, we've been doing this for years and years and years, but there's still people out there in the workplace who do not know what the dangers are. So what keeps going wrong then? We've said that asbestos has been around for a long time. Global bans started happening in the late 70s and through the 80s. So how come in you know, this decade, we are still getting people exposed? Um, I've just put some headline cases on this slide here um, for UK prosecutions. But, um, and the, the general themes are people not knowing that they were disturbing asbestos, information not being passed on when it's been available, information not being available. Um, people not using the, the appropriate trained individuals to either work, remove or work with asbestos. So these things still keep happening. So which indicates there are some systematic issues around um, asbestos management. <clears throat> so some of the um, 
areas that I've uh, found to be particularly interesting when we've been doing investigations and audits um, is actually leadership and accountability. So who owns the risk? So when um, I just touched on, if you ask the question, most people will say it's either health and safety or it's the person that runs the site. Um, actually, that ownership needs to be further up the leadership chain if it's going to be effective. Because when you look at overall management of an operation or premises, decisions are made at a lot higher level than that. Um, so who owns the risk? And it could be more than one department. Um, so for me, if it's about asbestos, it's in the fabric of the building, that's an estates issue and a property management issue just as much as it is a health and safety issue and just as much as it is the person who's operating within that environment. And um, so with that leads us on to think about all the interactions that we have from due diligence when we're setting up a new site that might contain asbestos right through to site level management. And we need people to be asking the questions at those early decision making interactions. Does there, uh, is there asbestos? Does that impact on what we intend to do with this building? So one investigation I've done, um, we traced back to due diligence. Um, somebody had been exposed and um, it was a tick box. There was, is there an asbestos um, survey? Due diligence said, yes, there is. And here's a copy of the survey. And then the asbestos at that time was deemed to be in good condition and it was going to be left in place. However, nobody considered that the taking that building and putting somebody else's processes and vehicles in it changed the operational element and that increased the risk to that asbestos. And so because of the operational change, the processes that were installed, the vehicles being used, that asbestos now became very vulnerable and it did get damaged and that's, that's the ultimate cause of the exposure that happened. So where are we making this decision? Um, that should lead us down a, a, ch a chain of different risk management questions. If we're gonna do something in this property, are we changing the nature of it? Are we creating an issue where the, the asbestos that's there is now vulnerable um, and people um, could damage it? The question also was they didn't actually communicate that information about the asbestos survey down the chain. So there was a lack of awareness. Um, and so they weren't considering asbestos risks at all these different stages. Um, so again, the, the communication of information um, wasn't there. And so people were making decisions not knowing asbestos was in place and exposures were happening. So some of the systematic issues then are um, not identifying key roles and establishing competencies. So it's more than just a health and safety issue. And generally speaking, health and safety professionals would be making people aware, might be doing some assurance work around auditing, might be doing inspections, but generally picking up issues um, when it becomes an issue because um, people making decisions or operational decisions not actually involving health and safety at a good point in time. Uh, we're not sharing good quality information. Um, and so people that do get asbestos surveys carried out um, need to be an informed customer on what they're expecting. So it's good practice to check within your local um, sort of infrastructure, um, your regulatory infrastructure about what the standards are around what a good survey looks like and what information people should be getting. Because it's not just about the location of the asbestos, it's around the condition of the asbestos materials and the ongoing management of that condition because if it does deteriorate then we need to be thinking about removing that asbestos. It's around not acting on the information received in an appropriate way. So some people will receive information that asbestos is there and because of their lack of awareness, the lack of training or the lack of support don't actually do anything with that information, it just gets filed away. Um, one of the investigations I was involved in, we actually found seven different asbestos surveys and yet the exposure had still happened because the people receiving that information weren't trained to deal with it. They didn't know that it was an issue. Um, and when we looked at the audit questions that they were being audited with, the question was, has there been an, an asbestos survey? And the answer was yes, but there was no follow up to that. There was no, what do we do next with that information? So the managers were assuming they were doing the right thing. Yes, I've got a survey, but then nobody was following through what we do next with that information. Um, it's awareness of managers and, and operatives about health risks and the occupational exposures um, risk. So if this isn't adequate, 
if people don't know, um, then they can't manage that risk properly. And so we find that some people have um, awareness at an operational level, but the management chain a few steps above that make decisions on, on spend and strategy around risk management don't necessarily understand the same thing. And they might see that it's a very expensive thing to, to, uh, to be managing and maybe not working around the right, right decisions that way. Um, and operatives as well, people that are out there doing the work. So if you're thinking about some of the high risk groups here are construction and allied trades. So um, electrical engineers, electricians, plumbers, painters, decorators, flooring specialists, roofers, anybody that might be breaking into the fabric of a structure, if they're not aware of what asbestos could be, where the types of materials it's been used and what those health risks are to them, then they're just carrying on working as normal and then they don't know. And so they can't stop and make an intervention for themselves because they're just not aware enough. So these systematic failures then are, um, generally fall around the competence of the people that are in that process of, um, of managing asbestos risks for asbestos materials that are, are still in place. So thinking about competence then, um, these are the kind of roles that um, I think if you've got a good sort of um, from decision being made around an operation or a location or an acquisition of a building or ongoing management right through to what the operation and, and the final product being put out the door as it were. These people or these roles all have a part to play or some of it's very light touch, some of it is much more hands on. Um, but they need to have a level of awareness suitable for the role that they are doing. So estates management and property uh, departments definitely need to be aware of asbestos issues, whether it's in an existing estate or whether they're looking to acquire new properties or move or take on other liabilities. Because we need to be asking those questions as early on as possible. Um, is there asbestos here? How does this impact on us? But with an operational um, foresight going on there is if we start to change what's going on here does that impact so facilities management again the ongoing maintenance of a building we want those people that have that responsibility to be aware of what asbestos risks are within their environment um, procurement again procurement of services sometimes going for the cheapest option is not always the best especially if we're looking at removal contractors and surveyors we want good quality well set up um, people doing those services for us and they don't come cheaply so sometimes we have to look at a balance between is this the cheapest option is that the best one to go for um, do they have the level of competence that we require financial controllers and decision makers again need to be aware that um, you, sometimes you can't um, balance cost on asbestos related decisions we need to have more information we need to make sure that this risk is well managed then we have operational management and that goes at all levels of operational management. Um, some of the investigations that I've done, um, local site management, local operational management were aware of the problem. They were fielding it up to the next uh, layer up and they weren't really making sensible decisions because they weren't really aware of the risk. They knew it was a problem. I've got people telling me it's a problem, but I've got 20 other problems to deal with. So this is what I'm going to focus on. Um, so going back to uh, said who's responsible, most people would generally say, oh, it's the local site management, operational management that have the overall responsibility for managing asbestos risk, whether it's setting people to work in somebody else's environment or whether it's people working in your own premises. Um, the amount of times I've, I've heard that and then gone to talk to the people that have this kind of accountability bestowed on them that do not have the appropriate skills given to them as well so they'll generally have an asbestos awareness but they don't have what it means for them to manage that asbestos as a property so how do we know it's you know what condition is it in do we have ongoing management of that are our staff aware of where they can and can't break through materials do we have a register so all of those questions in place they get limited information and then told to manage that risk. And some, that is sometimes where the key issues are about systemic failures happening. And again, it's the operatives who may work directly with asbestos containing materials, not being fully aware. But also we have people that 
don't work direct, and I think it's slipped off the bottom of the screen there, but people that are not directly working with asbestos are particularly vulnerable. So I'll take an example of we've got um, low level asbestos insulation board and we've got people moving equipment around and they break through it by accident. They're now exposed to that, but they weren't planning to break through that material. They weren't planning to work on it at all, but now they've become exposed. So if they're aware of what ACMs could be, where they might be, or, or actually preferably knowing exactly where it is because we've got quality information that's been shared, then they won't have those accidental um, exposures that happen. So as health and safety professionals, then what can we be doing about this problem? And I think it's, you know, um, about engaging with decision makers as well as the sharp end. It's about making sure that when we analyze um, the asbestos risk within our organization, that we identify those key aspects where we can make early interventions. Going back to doing a due diligence report for a, a property we might be doing an acquisition on is are we getting the right information and are we accepting the liability or are we saying we don't accept that liability of asbestos in that building, this is not the right place for us, or actually putting some responsibility back onto the landlord. So we have opportunities to make interventions early on in the process. It's about advising people in control of the work. So if we have transient workforces that are being set to work as construction and allied trades, we don't own um, the building, we don't own the structure, we don't own the environment, but we're putting people to work in a, in a potentially dangerous place. So how, how do we advise those people about controlling the work? It's about training the workforce, making sure that people are aware of the risks, but also getting that very specific information they might need to do their job safely. It's providing assurance through audit. And one of the things I've, as I mentioned, was not just are we asking the basic questions like, is there a survey in place? Have you trained people? It's about what are those next steps? So what have you done about the survey? What are you doing about ongoing management? And it's about identifying the competence requirements and the gaps within our organisations. Again, a generic approach to just rolling out an e-learning package for asbestos awareness is not going to help people that have to manage that material in, in a building. And it might be inappropriate for the people that are making decisions around property acquisitions. So we need to make sure that we know what those requirements are, where the gaps are and help people achieve that better learning. We also have to ask ourselves, do we have the necessary skills? Um, so are we personally equipped to do it? And so what CPD opportunities do we have to continually develop our profession? What qualifications or specialist training do we need? Um, do we need the support of an industrial hygienist or occupational hygienist? Um, do we have access to that support? And where are our resources and information that we can share around? Um, in terms of CPD, I do, because this is the route I've taken, so I've got quite personally invested interest, I suppose, but I wanted to be a health and safety advisor and a hygienist. So I've actually built up my hygiene skills through doing um, proficiency certificates and, and key areas. So. My main qualifications are in health and safety and occupational hygiene, but I've built on that by doing some noise uh, management courses over the years, by doing um, asbestos specific qualifications. So when I'm looking as a health and safety professional, I'm also looking at those opportunities to expand into occupational hygiene as a, an interesting and diverse way to, to develop. Um, so resources then that we can call upon um, through IOSH, obviously, we have the No Time to Lose um, campaign. I'm hoping that you're all quite aware of that because it is um, something we've been working on for a while. And they do have an asbestos-specific pack. Um, it's the latest um, one to be in the campaign. So you can go to No Time to Lose. Um, the European Agency for um, Safety and Health at Work have uh, a lot of information there. I've put a link on here so when you get this access to the slide you can click on and this gives us the current directive that was put out to the EU member states. So regulatory frameworks should be ref um, reflecting that EU directive there and it's a good framework. It gives us all the, the key principles around managing asbestos risk. And that um, picture I showed earlier where we've got an industrial building with the numbers and where we can find asbestos is taken from some health and safety executive um, guidance that, that is really good. The HSC have got all kinds of things on there. 
um, such as uh, the asbestos essentials, which is, gives us safe working methods for dealing with asbestos materials. That's good for people that might be doing low level work with asbestos that you don't need licensing or, or removal um, skills with. Um, but um, also it's a good benchmark. So if you've got people that are coming to work on asbestos on your behalf, you can take a look at that safe working method and say, are they reflecting that? Is this, the, this is a good standard. Are they achieving that good standard? Um, for some other facts, um, I found um, a history of global asbestos bans, which I found absolutely fascinating and I'm going to keep reading through. Um, not everybody is that um, intense around asbestos knowledge, but there's a link there to that chronological list. Um, it shows the um, countries um, that banned asbestos in the various stages because there were phased um, bans throughout the decades. It started with the blue and the brown, those amphibole type asbestos. And now, um, towards the late 80s and 90s, we saw the ban on, on chrysotile as well. Um, I found a fact sheet there that's specific to um, Switzerland, so some guidance there. And within that fact sheet, there are some links to other resources that I think you might find helpful. And also the World Health Organization um, and their um, information sheets around how we eliminate asbestos-related diseases.